So you've got to have this latent, deep potential to be able to do the thing well. Otherwise, we should just be honest with ourselves, be humble and say, that's just not my area, right? Like I, I just wouldn't succeed there. And let me benefit the kingdom of God by recognizing that sooner rather than later. So, okay, so that's great. Like how do we, you know, get to the highest of heights within whatever field that we're called to and yet remain humble in our calling. And I want to encourage us with three R's. We need to have the first R in place, which is recognizing where our resources come from, uh, recognizing the reason we do it, just like Tim was referring to as credit. And then thirdly, uh, how, do we th how do we think about results in the kingdom? And very briefly, um, in terms of resources, I think it's God's grace. And 1 Peter 4 ref uh, refers to that. In terms of uh, reasons, it's God's glory. And again, 1 Peter 4. But check, check out this verse that we talked about before. Uh, we're talking about God's grace and God's glory, our resources and our reason. Whatever gift you've received, right? So that is God's grace. We are to be faithful stewards of God's grace in its very... Now, look, this is what I love about, like, the Bible, is that it easily can become Christianese. Like, oh, yeah, faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. That sounds very Christian. But Peter is saying something very specific. He's saying God's grace has forms like electrical engineering and filmmaking. Does that make sense? And so now our, our, our resources, when we say it's God's grace, is no longer Christianese. It's really like some of you are particularly gifted to be a sound engineer or a dentist or a filmmaker. And then the verse 11 speaks to God's glory. If anyone serves, they should do with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised. So the reason is back to God's glory. The resource is God's grace. And then thirdly, in terms of the results, I think it's God's government. I know I get a little bit carried away sometimes with my alliterations, but this is a helpful reminder. Some of, some of you guys were talking about, you know, do numbers matter? I think yes and no. And I think Caleb and Alexa, you guys were really trying to parse that out. And that was great. It does matter in a sense, but it doesn't ultimately because Alison McGrath will preach in front of 11 people, right? If that grows to 11,000 in, in, in 10 years, great. If it doesn't, that's okay because he knows to whom he's been called and to what he's been called. But it's God's governance. The results are ultimately God's governance. What's this passage? Some of you guys re might recognize it off the bat, but it's this one right here, right? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Like you might just be the usher to Billy Graham and Billy Graham is going to be the one who watered like all over the world, but God will ultimately give the growth, right? So maybe I ushered and he preached, but God gave the growth. It's always ultimately God's governance, right? Um, so neither, is, uh, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And that's why, and here's the conclusion to this, the shortest definition on work, Christian work that I found that I think is very powerful, but Dorothy Sayers says, the only Christian work is good work well done. Again, that can sound like cool Christianese quote or whatever, but what does this imply, by the way? Just talk to me about this. Like if you, Dorothy Sayers, by the way, was like a friend of C.S. Lewis, and so she's kind of known to be like the female counterpart of Lewis during their day. So they ha hung out at the Socratic Club in Oxford and so on and so forth, but she has some really nice takeaways too. But Tell me, what does this imply? Like, don't, let's not just read this and be like, oh, that sounds cool, Christian, I can Instagram that. But what does that imply in terms of discerning our gift mix, which is where we're headed next? What does that imply? Okay, uh, how many of you guys are, are good at um, uh, basketball to the point where you can play on the NBA? No, but come on, like, you know, we've seen enough motivational YouTube videos where it says you can do it. You guys see the, the key and peel thing? You can do anything. You can literally fly. You can, okay, remember that? Like, <laughs> no, you can't fly, right? Like, you can't play in the NBA, most of us, I'm thinking, like, right? So what does it actually, what does this quote mean with respect to, are the, go ahead. Any good work that you are able to do well can be your gift, but it has to be something you can do well. Yes. Go ahead. And just because it's a good work, if yeah. you can't do it well, yeah. it won't make a Christian just because it's good. Yeah. Oh, well. Well said. Very well said. Right? 
So you've got to have this latent, deep potential to be able to do the thing well. Otherwise, we should just be honest with ourselves, be humble, and say, that's just not my area, right? Like, I, I just wouldn't succeed there. And let me benefit the kingdom of God by recognizing that sooner rather than later, right? Remember um, um, Professor John Lennox, the guy who was like, hey, remember, he was like, some of us should not be thinking about that big question of, God's sovereignty and human free will, and then he pointed me at, at me and my buddy. <laughs> not, not really. But Paul says, don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Right? So one thing I talk a lot about when it comes to like figuring out our gifts is uh, one of the examples I use is risk tolerance versus risk of if being risk averse. Right? So um, as an entrepreneur, a lot of people are just really they're risk tolerant. You know, it's the kind of thing that doesn't really bother them very much. In fact, they're kind of you know, access fuel. Um, so I don't know, can you talk about that a little bit and like kind of the way you operate and I know you've got your, you've got a lot of different things um, on your plate, but how does that, do you, does that ring true for you that um, that's a part of your gift and you know, how that made you who you are today? Uh, well, I come from a very unique place as an entrepreneur. First, it's like I can't take credit for being like the entrepreneur that everybody thinks who I am because my dad was truly like a, coming from like at 12, leaving home, starts mm -hmm. working, uh, 16, gets married, moves to Japan to, with my oldest brother to Brazil. So that, that's like sort of part of my DNA, right? Mm -hmm. And then I grew up with an older brother. That going, uh, uh, I have tried so many ventures prior to huh. even Wahoos. So I come from a family of support that says, oh, go ahead, take a step out there. Don't worry, because if you will fall, don't worry, we'll hear, we'll catch mm -hmm. you, kind of a thing. So I grew up with that atmosphere. So now as an adult and doing things on my own, uh, I'm used to taking risks. I'm mm. used to that and not worrying as much, but I also have a large family. So yeah. if I do fall, there's a lot of people catching me. Yeah, too, right, so. right. So even like your actual family upbringing and your relationships are part of what makes you who you are. And, yeah. yeah. So I, I learned a long time ago what I'm good at and what I'm bad at. Mm. So then I build teams around me that help me be better. And I'm constantly learning. So I know I can come up with ideas, but I don't know how to executing those ideas. So I have a team of people that now help me execute them, including mm. my wife now. So she's yeah, like, yeah. oh, hey, don't do that, don't do this. So I have a good team of solid yeah. people that help me to, to be able to succeed. How, how did you figure that out kind of early on, like what you are good at and what you're not? Well, again, with my older brother, we would sit together and uh, having the privilege of going, hey, what if we tried this? Mm. You know, originally a lot of people didn't realize, but we were going to be the original Buffalo Ranchers, you know, bison, uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, which is 20, getting really popular now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 30 years ago, it was wow. like, you're the only one out here doing this. So, <laughs> but things like that, where we would bounce each other's idea in a lot, and he would let me try my ideas, not just a, 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 you know, verbalize it, but actually put it into action. Yeah. And then I found out, oh, man, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at that. But I have a really great uh, uh, person that does all that. So my little brother, Mingo, is my, my CEO, our CEO, but he's the one that, manages everything he's the one that oversees everything for me he tells me no don't do that so when you get when i get a blessing from him to do, yeah. do something else wow. in my life it's like all right you right know? right right <laughs> now i got the guy behind me with all the yeah. floor, so, so, so wow that's amazing so really it is like this team or in your case much more family but they that kind of helps you figure out okay who what, who am i what am i good at um so what what characteristics would you say though in general like for yourself that um were a part of who you are to make you successful, to be the restaurateur that you are? Or any, would yeah. you say for anyone pursuing their calling? Well, everybody's got their own calling, everybody's mm -hmm. got their own gifts, but for me, I, I learned that I can think under pressure. Um, mm -hmm. um, I can come up with ideas, and I'll come up with four different ideas, um, and, and then bounce it off somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also the guy that if, uh, if I don't know a subject well enough, like let's say I need an expert in real estate, I'm not, I don't get embarrassed if I don't know that yeah. subject. So I'll go to the best real estate guys. Goes, what are we doing here? How mm -hmm. can I learn from you guys? What are you, what are some of the things? And and I get that knowledge. And then I go back and I absorb it all. So if I don't know a subject, mm -hmm. that's when I feel like the most challenged. I'll go out there and, and you know dive in deeply and say, okay, these are the things. And then kind of break it all apart for the easier parts for me. And then I go back and say, hey, Mingo, what do you think about this? What yeah. can we do here? Yeah. And then come up with ideas. Uh, and, and that's where I think my gift is. I, I can think under pressure, I can't cook under pressure. Yeah. I mean, there's a big difference because yeah, people right. think, well, you can think under pressure, you can ex execute under pressure. No. Huh. It, 
thinking and other person and executing are two different mm -hmm. things. So you need that balance with somebody who's even more calm on, that doesn't get overly excited. Yeah. To get in there because okay, let's all everybody calm down. Right. Let's take a step back. It came up with this all, let's try it. And then, ooh, that didn't work. You know, yeah, yeah. that's the other thing that you know I've been very fortunate is that when something doesn't work for our team, we don't get mad. Mm -hmm. It's now it becomes like let's fix it ASAP. Uh, because no one can foretell the future, so we learn by making a mistake, but we also learn don't do that twice, don't do that three times for sure. So it, it's always a learning experience for us. Uh, even with Wahoo's all these years, we celebrate 30 years and we're still learning. So. Yeah, yeah. Finish off here, it's the time wise. Um, this is that verse I was telling you guys about. Just take note of it. You don't have to write the whole thing, of course. Just maybe the reference. But you'll notice that gifts are not the same as abilities. Let me just try to define it again. Gifts is all that we've been given. Everything. Family, past scars, money, and I mean everything, right? Your physical um, strength, your intellectual strength. Everything we've been given. Now, abilities are what we do with those things. <laughs> and God will give more or less according to how faithful we steward the things he's already given us. So please, get, even though in English it sounds the same, talents, gifts, skills, abilities, it's not. Gifts are all that we've been given. Relationships, resources, money, experiences, education, hurts, successes, all of that. And then abilities is, okay, now what are you going to do with all that? such that I might bless you more because you've been responsible and good and faithful. As Matthew 25 says, as the parable says, how faithful are we with what we've been given? Here, here's that gift mix I was telling you about. The take home on all this, by the way, really is how are you and I going to figure out our gifting? And that's really through mentorship. It's, I'm telling you that a 20 three-year-old in your life could see things in you, but a 43-year-old in your life um, could see things differently than every 23. Generally, you guys with me? Generally speaking. And so to continue to engage with folks, um, um, you know, a generation above us is only going to help you figure out gifting, usually typically a little bit better and faster, right? So I'm going to, I want to, I'm going to constantly hit home on this idea of mentorship and uh, it's always, uh, the reason why I want to bring this one up is, if you notice, um, uh, this is at a pub. This is Oz Guinness, who's a mentor of mine. But um, Dr. Guinness is, is a big time like, you know, speaker and writer and deep man of God. And he, um, <laughs> mentorship is more caught than taught. And so we were hanging out. We were there. And then the um, server, the helper that was coming along to help us for like, more drinks or chips or whatever, he came along and then like he was, he had just put down the thing and then he came back with the chips or whatever and he, um, he knocked over Oz's entire full glass of his drink like all over his lap. And then, you know, in an instant he jumps up and he says to the, uh, the server was like so deeply apologetic, right? And the f he just said, no worries. Right? He was just so calm, sincere, genuine, and didn't want to embarrass the guy at all. And so he was like, oh, no worries, and totally put the whole situation at ease within an instant. And he didn't give me a PowerPoint lesson on how I should be, you know, how I should be in those kind of situations. But you, you catch these. They're caught rather than taught. But in mentorship, I highly encourage, I mean, the best education you can get is one in which it's multifaceted. So whether it's professor office, professor's office hours or just praying and really thinking through how can, we, how can I find someone who's a generation above me that can see things in me that I can never see for myself, that my best friends can't even see even though they love me, even though they love me. Um, and so, I'm, I mean, I, I was so tempted to put in an assignment for the class on uh, a mentorship assignment where you have to meet someone, you know, multiple times throughout the semester. I didn't, but um, that's an assignment that should go without grading. Like, you guys should just do it because it's a good thing to do. My, uh, my, my kind of self-assignment is I've got like, I think I told you guys, I've got like, I don't know, a thousand 20-year-olds in my life and a thousand, not a thousand, a lot less, like a hundred 60-year-olds in my life. And my desire is to make these people meet because... <laughs> They're, that's just a wise thing for the kingdom, you know? And there used to be a day when churches were quite intergenerational, and so there was deep 
kind of mentorship naturally happening. But nowadays, it's like kids ministry and youth group, and then never the twins shall meet. You know what I'm saying? Like that's kind of nowadays. But do yourself a favor. It's like yeah, seek it out. Um, uh, a lot more we can say about mentoring, uh, and we will. But um, and and yeah. So yeah, that's that's just sort of. It. Any other questions on that? Uh, a good good couple of books, which we obviously are already going to read, is how do we get to know ourselves a bit? The Enneagram is going to be helpful there. And then the other thing is the Dallas Willard on hearing God. Um, let the let the Spirit speak to you directly too about what your gifts might be. And so, um, if you guys like, I can't find a mentor to save my life. Maybe well, maybe we can help. But also. <laughs> the greatest mentor of all, right? So go to the Lord. And, and so anyways, these two books are important for that. This is very recent. As of just a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to visit um, this church called Saddleback, which I think you're probably familiar with in this area. There's this pastor named Rick Warren. You may be familiar with him too. Uh, people like Barack Obama apparently are familiar with him. You know, he's a pretty well-known guy. But Rick Warren... Um, in, in this, this was really just a, a little handout they gave everyone that walked through that day. It was like two Sundays ago. Um, it's amazing. They had recorded, they, I guess they had the wits enough to record how many baptisms they've had since 39 years ago when they first started Saddleback. But 50,000 baptisms in the course of 39 years, right? What I found, a number I found interesting was, this is kind of neat, like um, Rick and his wife Kay, they mailed out nearly 14,000 hand-addressed invitations to their first service. So that's neat. That Talk about grinding it out for the kingdom. That's, that's, that's not automated, right? Like that's, that was before, you know, uh, computers probably. I don't know, what well, 39 years ago. But yeah. Um, and yet, right, so 50,000 baptism, let alone, you know, members or people that his message has touched or whatever. So on the other hand, let me just point out real quick an example of sort of on the other side. So I mentioned briefly, I think last time, but Alistair McGrath, you know, this theologian, brilliant man who also happens to write, you know, just textbooks that UCLA, this was UCLA uses because he's just a good historian, right, and theologian, not just like a Christian, you know what I'm saying, like I just write books for seminaries. He does that too, and these books, some of you guys probably have I heard in one of the classes I used two of his books. And so obviously ma majorly impactful with his work in terms of numbers. And yet, and he could probably have a pastoral position at any large mega church in the world, probably, um, certainly in, in England where he's from. But I had a chance one time to visit him. Um, and I wrote to him because I was working with him. And I said, uh, Alistair, is it okay if I visit your church? I'd love to see where you're speaking this particular weekend. We had a weekend off here. And so... Uh, he said, sure, come, come, here, uh, come to this church. Here it is in such and such, you know, uh, part of uh, uh, the villages of, like, north of Oxford. And so uh, I went, and as soon as I got there, it was, a, I mean, it's, first of all, it took a while to get there because it was, like, really in the backwaters, like, middle of England, hard to find. I didn't have GPS because I didn't want to spend the money on it. And so I did Google Maps printing out, remember that, where you had to print stuff out beforehand. And I was like, where is this place? It, I, I think... And we ended up sh like showing up like, I don't know, 20 minutes late or something. But we got there and you walk inside and there are 11 people in the congregation. Um, this church, you can't see it on, it's on the opposite of this picture, but um, the, the church is from like the 14th century. It's in the villages of England. And here's Alistair McGrath preaching his heart out to 11 people, eight of whom were over the, probably the age of 70. There was one young couple and their very young newborn, Right. So three people, and then eight, so 11 people, and then us, right? And they were very warm, and it was really great to have met those people. But for Alistair, he was just faithful to this village. I mean, literally a village in the middle of England. I remember one time we were hanging out over lunch, and I won't mention the names and details, but there was a bit of a scandal going through Hollywood. Shocking. Yeah. A scandal at Hollywood? <laughs> yeah, right. What's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> now that one time it happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, uh, you know, I, you, took, you said something, and it I really resonated with me, and I took it away, and it kind of became the motto for our, our, our next year. Um, but the phrase was, it matters how you get there. Mm. Talk about that. So to me, it's very similar in terms of, you know, the workplace and the job that 
if we kill each other to get to the goal line and mm -hmm. we'd step on people and literally destroy people in getting to the goal line, mm -hmm. what, did, what did we win? Mm -hmm. What kind of a career are you building that, that every project you work on, someone gets shot mm -hmm. in the back of the head mm -hmm. and destroyed so, so that you can be advanced? Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, what is that? Yeah. So to me, it does matter how you get there. I, I want to bring everybody over the goal line. Mm. Some kicking and screaming, others willfully. Sure. But I want to bring everybody over the goal line together yeah. um, and not lose anybody along the way. So it, to me, it does matter. So in a movie like Adrift that I just finished, which is very much um, a very difficult movie, six of the 10 weeks out in the open water, right. three miles out from land. Yeah. It's life threatening. Yeah. Well, it's not gonna happen on my watch. I will go, that's the wrong word, uh, overboard. I'm gonna go uh, to whatever extent to be sure that my crew is safe and taken care of and well rested hmm. and, and whatever I can do to be sure that you know they're taken care of even as we're trying to tell this story, yeah. which is about survival, yeah. um, you got to take care of the crew or it's not worth it. Yeah. And so I ordered a very expensive quarter of a million dollars a month boat to come up to be our, our, our uh, platform, literally, that we could shoot out in the open water. And I told the studio that this is for safety. Mm. And, and I said to them, you can replace me but I'm not gonna have anybody get hurt mm. on my watch, so we're gonna order this boat. We'll try to find ways to save that money, but I'm telling you now mm. that I've ordered the boat. It's coming. We're committed for a month, and if you don't like it, you're gonna replace me. Come on down here and take the job. Mm. To which you have crickets. <laughs> you know, they don't say a word because they don't wanna do that. Yeah. They, they, and, you know, and, and at least they were smart enough to know that, you know, 19 time zones away, they got to trust the person who's the Yeah. And so they did. But, but I truly was willing to go home. Yeah, yeah. It, does, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not yeah. going to... After all risk, this, yeah, I, yeah, right. somebody gets hurt or right. killed on my show? Yeah, right. Why would I do that? Yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah. So um, it gets harder with, you know, your boss with a director who demands that we do it a certain way mm -hmm. and, and I have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Mm. So I've done that. Mm. It doesn't hurt that I'm tall. I can sort of look some of these guys in the eye. Not all of them. Some <laughs> i got to still keep looking up at. Um, but it's hard. Yeah. And I, I think there's a moral center inside of you that you've got to pay attention to, mm. to have the fortitude to go do that, to know what is valuable, what's going to last, what's important. Um, who do I have to look in the eye at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately that's what you have to do. <laughs> <laughs>